Um, so the first thing we have to talk about is very important. What, what is a shoulder joint composed of, right? And the biggest thing to understand is this is like a golf ball on a tee, right? So the golf ball is much bigger than the tee. Like one fourth of the, of the tee is open and the golf ball sits very much outside of it. So inherently, it makes the shoulder be able to move in crazy directions, but it's inherently unstable, right? Because it, all that range of motion is then needs to be controlled for. And that's kind of the premise of what we're getting at. So if it sits very loosely, right, other things that we have to get the golf ball to stay on the tee and not have it slide around are gonna be passive things and active things. Passive things being what, anybody have any ideas? Passive things that keep your shoulder stable? Ligaments. Ligaments, tendons, right, and then the bony alignment. If someone inherently has a bony alignment that's deeper than the socket, they sit more well versus most of the girls we see, or the guys we see from gymnastics, have a shallower thing, but we can't change those things. They're born with that. Very loose, lax girls. Uh, there's a capsule that surrounds your shoulder, like a garbage bag around, like a, a golf on tee. And if someone has a redundant, it's like a sleeve too. If someone has a redundant capsule, they're more prone to be lax versus if someone's born very stiff and the capsule is not redundant, they can't. Those are like the typical, like you know, we heads typically have a lot of restrictions. But our girls are, and our guys are all very loose in their capsule, very loose ligaments. That's through natural selection why they ended up in gymnastics in the first place, right? That's how they got so good because someone in their rec class was like, whoa, look at your shoulder, you're on the team, right? You can do this. So, it's important that we know that there's act passive things and there's also um, active things. So those are rotator cuff, scapular muscles, uh, and believe it or not, the things around um, the things around our shoulder, our shoulder blade, our core, our thoracic spine, our elbow, and our wrist. Force goes through it as one unit. It's not just one thing. So because these girls don't, and these guys, I keep saying girls, because I only work with female gymnast coaching, um, those uh, people don't have inherent passive support. So if they are gonna be doing gymnastics at a high level, they need absolutely pristine control. They need rotator cuff function, they need shoulder blade function to be like superhuman, right? I've never treated a girl for a shoulder problem in my clinic who is not strong enough. They all lack coordination and control and timing. That's really what it is. Because push-ups and all those things are much more power output driven. But the things I'll show you today, which we do a lot of, are much more about coordination, control, and teaching the shoulder blade and the shoulder muscles to keep the golf ball on the team, which happens at an automatic level like if we would put their arm up, congratulations, you just worked your rotator cuff. Like it has to happen to keep the ball in the tee or else it'll slide out. Cool? So that's the thing that we're gonna focus on. How do we really get at that active support in a full controlled range? So guys doing Deons and Stutzes don't tear their shoulders up, or if you ever get to like Mazarian, right? Or girls who wanna work endos or in bars or jams, right? How do we get that much control here, just as much as control here? Because we live in here. But when you put a girl back here, or you put her under here for a jam, that's when things really start to get nice, right? If you don't have the same control back here as you do in here, problems happen back here. Problems don't happen over here. You sublux your shoulder out here, right? So you need to be working in that end range, which is what I'll teach you guys about. Um, so we talked about this, right? The people that we're gonna deal with, it's much more than just push-ups, pull-ups, and all those things. We have to be thinking about more than one. This is my, my favorite quote from Dr. Sand, right? Don't trick yourself into, into shape. Don't just do more overshoots to get stable shoulders. Don't just do handstand pops to get, because if they're inherently unstable and you're just jumping right to handstand pushups, you gotta remember that's, what, 70 pounds on top of their shoulder joints bouncing up and down. So we have to find a way to bridge the gap, which is what we do in strength conditioning, right? That's why we use strength conditioning and regular control work to teach the shoulder to work automatically and then we put it into skills. But if we just jump to overshoots, jump to you know ring Maltese work or whatever it is, you're gonna skip, you're gonna skip over the system and it's, you're gonna tear up stuff in the process. And I call that collateral damage. Like when you're trying to do skills, but you're like tearing apart the cuff a little bit, little by little by little, that's collateral damage. I think we can be better about getting kids to be stronger and stable without that collateral damage. Because then four years down the road, like my teammates were dropping like flies. I didn't do rings, but like all my gymnast friends in college, label tear, label tear, cortisone, cortisone. You know, some of the girls that I work with, you know, one capsule shift, two capsule shifts, big surgery. The girls are 15 years old. They're like, right, you guys are 21 years old going to college with two label tears, like one of the guys in college. It's like a war zone, man. It's because we don't, I don't think we do some of this stuff. And control over strength, right? Control being fine-tuned adjustment, strength being push-ups, handstand push-ups, rope climbs, all that stuff, right? So the big prime movers are more geared towards strength, lats, pecs, deltoids, the small stabilizers of your rotator cuff. You know your rotator cuffs are like this big, the four muscles are like this big. They're really not big, and they work at very low level activation, under 25%. So like if you maximally contract them, that'd be a strength move, but if you just like, like I said, put your arm up, very low threshold, and that's the thing. We're gonna to try to teach you guys some stuff that's like <coughs> more about the low threshold because that's where the money is. So this is the first thing. All right, hey, it's your moment to shine. So I'm gonna use Taylor as a good. Where's the Taylor stuff? I'll just do it over here. So come lay right here. 
So this is the, by far the biggest issue to why people end up like going to your stomach. So there's an active motion versus a passive motion. Sure, why they end up where? In my clinic, okay. what's your only problems? <laughs> so, right, somebody goes, Tay, lay down, arms up for me. Oh, your shoulders are a little tight, we gotta work on that, right? And so what they do, they go like this, and like, all right, relax, come on, stretch them out, stretch, stretch, stretch. Do you think this girl needs any more stretching? No. Absolutely not, but look at how big the difference is between how high she can go, go ahead, and how high I can go. This is the sketchy range. This is where bad stuff happens. Right? So this is showing me she has plenty of tissue length, she has plenty of capsular mobility, but if I just like look at her at a glance and like or see her do a back hamstring like this is Heather, she puts her arms to like here and then she hinges with her lower back. So when I see her in her beam skill, I'm like, oh, your shoulders might be tight. And you lay her down and she's like, oh, she can't lift them up. But if I didn't take the time to look at that, it's a green trapezoid above that. She's six inches above the green trapezoid. So she clearly has, look at the angle difference from the first one to the second one. She does not need more stretching. No more, right? And if I stretch her, her shoulders gonna become loose and unstable because I'm giving her a range she can't control. She catches an overshoot handstand and her shoulder slides up. Does that make sense? So I can't tell you how many people come to the clinic and they're like, my shoulder's just stiff, right? And they put their arms up and they do like a little back bend and it looks terrible, but you lay them down and you can lift them up to 195 degrees. Or their shoulders move really, really well, almost too much and their middle back is not moving up. To do this, you need a lot of things, your lap, your pec, your soft tissue, your middle spine, your core has to be stable. So if you just assume that this is the problem, you stretch, 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 but what if their stiffness is in the thoracic spine because they hollow too much? And you're just cranking on their shoulders. You're taking the shoulder joints sliding out of the socket. And then that girl goes to do something and it, you know, that's when a problem comes up. So I tried, I'll, I'm probably repeating on my slides, I'm just going off the fly. But I separate the girls into who needs more mobility and who does not need more mobility. If you need more mobility, let's do some soft tissue work, let's roll out, we'll do some gentle stretching, we'll get you there. And if you need more control work like her and these other girls, you don't need to do any more stretching. And I think people don't understand the uh, active versus passive. It's very simple to do that. Hands on their middle of their back and just lift them up the side of the hand. They can go to 100, 200 degrees. You don't need any more, right? And I'll show you another one. Stay here, I'm gonna need you again. But that's very, very, oh yeah, that's Taylor. So Taylor, lay down here. So you back, and I'm gonna show you this. Because Taylor had a shoulder problem because she had too much range she couldn't control. And she was doing overshoots, right? So can everyone see this? <clears throat> right, relax. So this is where the, the physical therapist hat comes on, so you're not allowed to do this at all. Right? But if I put her in a few ranges of motion, anybody watch like Major League Baseball? Yeah. She has more range than a Major League pitcher. Right? And when I put her the other way, she has an arc of motion that's probably over most Major League pitchers. So, if, and I'm holding her shoulder. This is just shoulder motion. This is not, it's cheating, right? But if I put her like this, she has 90 degrees. She has probably a hundred and, you know, 200 degrees, right? If I stretch this poor child, <laughs> I'm gonna dislocate her shoulder. And when she first came to me, because she came from the gym, I could, when I first evaluated her, I could take her shoulder and slide it out of the socket manually. And she would feel it go in and out, right? So she has lots of passive support, but no active support. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's very important to remember because I think we don't do that. <laughs> and I didn't do that as a younger coach. I was just, saw a shoulder angle and I was like, I'm gonna stretch more. But this is more of a problem is that she doesn't know how to access, her brain does not have access to that end range and she's not strong enough to get back there. And she doesn't have enough control. So when she gets to here, her brain goes, oh yeah, oh, this is unstable. And it reflexively guards against it. It won't let her access her full range of motion because her nervous system is scared. If your brain perceives a threat with a range of motion, it just won't let you do it. It's at a, a brain stem level, which doesn't happen. So if you're cranking that girl into a range she can't control and you toss her up with a giant swing, which is two and a half times your body weight and force, that's when your shoulder starts to slide up. That make sense? So it's very, very important to remember. These girls, these girls and guys don't need more stretching. Because they have their, they have that passive support, it's lacking. Okay, um, And like I said, if you stretch her, she's gonna get her, she's gonna lose flexibility because her brain's gonna guard against it. You can do PNF, you can do foam rolling, you can do the craziest stretch you've ever done in the world. It's gonna give it another day, come back, she'll be tight again. Tighten right back up. Because her brain is giving you the ultimate no thank you. Right? And her brain happily chooses survival over, I want my back hands to look good. Okay, so that's very important. We're gonna hurt somebody if we try to go anymore. If you take that plus high force scale, high volume, you're gonna, you're gonna beat up someone's shoulder in the process. Um, we talked about that, right? It's, it may not be a mobility problem in the first place, right? Active versus passive. Second of all, if it is a mobility problem, it might not be their shoulder. It could be their middle back, it could be their core. It could be, you know, I've seen girls who come up with wrist extension problems and their handstand looks jacked up and you look at their shoulders like, oh, that shoulder angle, and you just chase the shoulder. But if their wrist can't extend, they can't stack their body weight over, 
and that's a problem down here. And you go, look at your wrist, and they go, hey. you go, yeah, wrist problems, like, yeah, I had wrist surgery. And the problem is down here, it just looks like a shoulder angle. So if they hit the beam, it's yeah, go ahead. So can you basically, I guess, I'll, I'll call it, follow the chain, like, if it seems like the problem here, you can start? Yeah. Check marks. I go, every, any gymnast that walks in my door, whether it's a big toe problem or a pinky toe problem or a shoulder problem, I look at everything, head to toe. How's your neck move? How's your middle back move? How your shoulders move? Elbows, wrists, hips, knees, ankles. Because if she, same thing with landing mechanics, right? If girls have low back pain when they land, because they land hyperextended, but I check their ankles and they have like 10 degrees of ankle mobility, they land stiff and they draw their back. And they're like, oh, you gotta work in your core control and your, your glutes are not activating right and you're inhibited and all this other shenanigans. I'm like, well, you don't want to check her ankle? And she's like, <laughs> your ankle pain? Yeah, Achilles problems. That sea is good, right? Same thing with your wrist, right? Oh, your shoulder angle. We gotta work your shoulder angle. Come and check your wrist. Cause you're hitting the back handspring angle at like <laughs> negative degrees, and you're cranking on your shoulders to get there, right? So I, I say these things because we have to make sure we're not assuming things. And even if it's a mobility problem, right? Because girls do have restriction in this area, right? You do a lot of shoulder work. It does get tight, but it's not only their lats. <laughs> it's not their lats and their pecs. There's 13 muscles that you have to have extending to get your arm over your head. Teres, pec minor, pec major, posterior capsule, you know, anterior laxity, all those things have to be extending well for you to get your arm over your head. And if you're like, oh, so lats, and you put her on a bar and you start stretching her, what if it's her pec minor? Like, and I, I'll show you with Kara, so that's her situation. Um, so you have to work with a health care provider or someone to look at it, right? But this is really where it comes down to all this before we go into training application. So you take someone who has no passive support, unfortunately some coaches push real hard in their flexibility, and they don't train their control work, they just do push-ups and rope climbs and chin-ups. Um, and then you put them in a high force situation under high repetition, 10,000 reps per year maybe. And then you put that person in a rapid growth spurt where their growth plates are open, and their bones are growing faster than their tendons can keep up. This is like absolute recipe for disaster. Like I, I have 12 year olds in my clinic who hit a growth spurt and were learning like blind changes or pirouettes. Their shoulder was not ready for one arm loading, and their shoulder was like sliding on them. It's because of all these things we're talking about. Does that make sense? Is there any questions on that? Because a lot of that stuff is like, whoa. <laughs> yes. So, ideally, should you, before you even begin this sport, you should kind of have an assessment of flexibility. Speaking my language, man. Stability. I do a full 30 minute assessment on every gymnast that I have every year. I check it, shoulders, wrists, elbows, knees, low back, check for fractures, check for osseous slaughters, how's their ankle mobility. All right, if someone, if I put, and I just did this on her last week, but I was rechecking to see if she was unstable and she's getting better. Shoulder hasn't hurt that bad, but she still does two times a week her own free app program for her shoulders because they're just inherently unstable. Same thing with her low back, you know? So I suggest, I can do it, I can cheat because I am a healthcare provider, but there are tons of very intelligent healthcare providers out there and they would love to come in and check out and just do a quick screen. What in title? title? Under what title? Uh, so I study under the SFMA system, which is what I learned a lot of. And you can Google the SFMA provider. If you're local, I'll do it for you. SFMA, Selective Functional Movement System. Anybody, anybody who has intelligent background and movement can, can do this stuff for you. And like, uh, have you seen this girl's shoulder? Like, whoa, caution, right? Low back fractures, ankle problems, all that stuff. Our injury rate dropped in half in the last year. 50% of from 39 injuries to 17 because I think we started to be better about training and adapting individual strength programs to these girls that need it. Yes? Is it also true for boys that they probably have the flexibility that they need? Absolutely, yeah. These guys, these, same thing with guys tend to get natural selection if they pick up as Gumby when they're little. I think they start to lose their flexibility when we don't do enough preventative care and they get tight or they grow fast. Uh, guys typically tend to be more in the mobility category but they need more mobility. But there's ways to do that without just stretching. Soft tissue work, you know, finding, if you get a good movement assessment and you, somebody can just spend an hour with them and like kind of work manual therapy on one, retest the motion, work on this one, you can find the one area or muscle that's probably the most problematic and you can just snipe that one out versus being like, let's try all these different mobility exercises. And I get emails about that all the time. Like, my kid has this and this wrong. I'm like, what can I do? Like, I have no idea. Because <laughs> unless you're sitting in front of me and I test and retest, like, if I give you the wrong thing, I'm gonna hurt you. If, it, if it's your pec and I give you a bad exercise, I haven't fixed the problem, I'm making this worse because this is probably already too mobile. So there's a lot of things it could be, but boys typically tend to be more mobility driven because of how much upper body volume they do. But I see a lot of people who have emails about the same thing. They're just very mobile young kids, you know, that have problems. And they do a lot of extension work, P bars, rings, and all that stuff. So they usually they have more tissues they just can't control their full range. Good. But it can be both. 
It can be either or. Again, I don't know until I assess somebody. So moving on, team up. Um, and this is another big one for me. Is like, don't be afraid to safely put weight in a kid's hand. Because uh, what we were talking about in the last lecture with the warm-up and the Achilles one, people are like, well, if you, wait, if you use weight, you're gonna hurt the kid, right? Because it's too much loading for the system. I'm like, do you realize the floor is 17 times their body weight? It's, all, it's ridiculous how high the forces are. They're already getting loaded, and the problem is that they can't handle it. The, the forces are more than their body can handle, and that's why the tissue gets damaged, right? So training and, and using weights safely and progressively with good technique is a way to bridge the gap between, you can take this much, but gymnastics is this much. Okay, if we go through a strength program, now we have a buffer that's lower, right? Now you can take a little bit more, you've got more in the tank to work with before you start to break down. So we do a ton of strength training with weights and kettlebells, which I'll show you, and no one has yet to become a She-Hulk or like lose their flexibility or their leaps. They're still just as mobile, clearly, right? But Taylor can deadlift half her body weight, right? She can do a Turkish getup with very heavy weight for her proportional body. So we're not, if you do it safely, and I work with great strength coaches, Brian, a couple of my friends up in the North Shore, and they've taught me the right way. We taught them the technique over a month or so, and the girls just know it now. They just know how to work with kettlebells. They know how to work with weights safely, with good technique, and I'm on them all the time. Knee out, go that way, shoulder here, don't do that. Go down in the weight, you're falling apart. That's what a good coaching is about. But we have to be okay with putting weight in their hands because it's the only way they're gonna get stronger. It's not all about, it's not all about just you know, gymnastics specific work. You have to be able to load them. And our girls weight lift once a week. They go to a gym with barbells and get Olympic weightlifting. They're awesome. Yes? So, what is, I, so I guess a safer way would, for the safer way to, I guess, to kind of with, to address the problems that are going on, just be really to bring your body through a full range of motion. Um, not with a lot of weight, but with something that's heavy enough to bring it right. but not necessarily forcing it. Right, so you gotta get full range of motion first, full controlled range of motion actively. And then once you get full active control, then you can start to load it, if the technique is right. Right, so the perfect example is uh, like this, like this, we'll show you Julie I use, right? So if her passive limit is way up there, but her active limit is there, I'm gonna have her put her hands up on a panel mat up to her, just about her flexibility passive limit, and have her start to work on picking her arms up. Because that's how her brain neurally starts to access that range of motion. And then when she gets good at it, I put a floor bar in her hand. And then when she gets better at it, I put a two pound weight on it. Or we have her do like a little uh, weighted stick bar lift. And you can slowly get the brain to pick up on how to use the motion, and then you just go and you teach it like all of us do as coaches. When you swing your arms, I really want you to feel your shoulder blades feel like they're gonna burn off the back of your chest because that's full range of motion. You know what I mean? And then in terms of loading for any other strength exercise, like we do like a half kneeling press. You show me a good half kneeling press, good technique, hips are under, butt's tight, press, full range of motion, good. Five pound weight, that's what you're starting with in the summer. First week, five pounds. Three weeks of that, then 10 pounds. Three weeks of that, maybe two more pounds, maybe five more pounds. And to the point where they really struggle. That's when you get to that edge of ability is when your system adapts. That's how your brain adapts. It has to be challenged to adapt, because we never challenge them to weight safely. That's what, that's what strength conditioning is. Safely adapting the system in a controlled manner. You know, so that when you kick them off to do blind change, they have a one-arm stack column reference to go to. That's why we do Turkish get-ups on every blind change day, because it's essentially a one-arm stack. So, so it sounds like we're kind of working backwards. I am, I'm working backwards, so no, not you, I mean. forwards. Oh, we Coach are. Generally more sometimes we're to use the big muscles instead of. Yep. Sometimes we just stabilize. We just throw these kids into level seven and start working pirouettes, and then the system gets overloaded, and that's why they end up in my office. But we don't have any way to bridge the gap. All right. So think, think brain, think, think movement wise. This is uh, one of our girls. So just think in terms of shoulder. Don't think gymnastics. Right? So I saw four distinctly different things happening to the shoulder. And I'll show you what I mean. This is how my nerdy brain is. Right? So in terms of, I saw a top two arm compression, right? And I think that that transfers over to some of these side loaded drills that I'll show you. You can't say so. Oh, is this better? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so I saw two arm compression right on top of the giant. And I see some of these drills on the side. I see this shoulder angle that I really want to see with this pat, this mat in the top. And then I see a two arm hanging compression, or sorry, traction hanging forces, which is what we do a shoulder blade drill that I'm gonna show because we don't have a bar. This is this is one of Tay's pre app programs. But just hanging and working on scapular circles from the high bar. And we do this as a pre app station a lot. So it's like swing your long hang, go do a back central the handstand with blind, go to the wall and do a hold for a drill, hang on five circles, then come back, chalk up, get back in line. Right, and she's five circles front back, and we're preparing her shoulders to handle 
that elongation force, right? So you see up top and the bottom are there. And then I also see, because it was a blindfold, one arm on her left, right? I see these maybe little prehab isolated wide drills we use a lot. And I also see a Turkish get up because her arm is on one hand loaded. And if you literally just flip her upside down, it's a blind change. You see what I mean? So we're, we're slowly starting to prepare the shoulder complex to handle load so that when she does swing, there's something there to hang on actively. It's not just hoping her shoulder survives. I think a lot of girls survive optional gymnastics. I don't think they actually get through. <laughs> I'm serious. Whoever's the most durable, right? Overhead carries we do a ton of, right? Get the weight, press it up, and just walk up and down the floor. Because when you're walking like this with a weight in your hand, your shoulder's just like all over the place, and your brain's like, well, I gotta figure this out. Right, but that's how the golf ball is sliding around the tee, and your brain's figuring out automatically how to do it. My opinion is that when you have a millisecond to catch a handstand for an overshoot, it doesn't matter how many pull-ups you did. It's how fast can you turn it on and prepare yourself for load. So we do pull-ups, we do push-ups, we do rope climbs, we do all that stuff. But we also do a ton of this stuff, too. Because in the moment, you just gotta have it automatically at a reflexive level. And that's how you do it with a kettlebell carry. Because if the weight's overhead, then you're just like, like I'll fire my left trap 30%. That's not how it works. It just happens. Does that make sense? So we do these loading drills to make it automatic. Do you have sort of like a list of ways yeah, like coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. I'm like, I'm like prepping everybody, right? It was like, oh, just show me, just I show me. It's coming right now, it's just coming right now. But the thing for me is like, if I just showed you the drills, None of them would have made sense. Like, oh, that was cool, drill the Congress. But you wouldn't have understood why it's important. Why we don't want to stretch Taylor and give her just a heavy kettlebell instead. Because right? whenever we stretch, I have her go through her range of motion lightly, and then she does prehab work at the end of the workout. She doesn't stretch crazy anymore. Versus somebody else who is a little bit stiff, I have them work on foam roller stuff, don't go near the kettlebells. Because if I put you a weight over your hand, your arm is terrible. We're going to just keep. All right, switch.